Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of our Bizarre and Unusual World. Today I'm going to be covering an unsolved case for you guys, and that is the mystery of room 1046. As usual, I will be covering the who, what, when, where, why, and how of this unsolved mystery. Let's start with the win for this case. The year was 1935, and to be exact, this case really starts on January 2nd, 1935. Now, as for the where, most of this case takes place at the President Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. So what? What is this whole unsolved case about, and what is the timeline for its mystery? So on that day in January, a man checked into the President Hotel. He registered as Roland T. Owen. For the most part, he seemed like a regular guest for them. Um, it is noted he requested a room that would face the courtyard instead of the outside street. Uh, as he registered, it was noted that his hometown was Los Angeles. This man was estimated to be 20 to 35 years old. He had brown hair, a scar on his scalp, and something called cauliflower ear, which if you're not familiar, this is most of the time it's from a trauma to the ear, and I'll add a picture in, in case you're not familiar with that. Something a little odd for a hotel stay that was noted by the bellboy um, is that he had no luggage whatsoever. He was only carrying his items on him, which was a hairbrush, a comb, and a thing of toothpaste. So right after checking into the hotel and being taken to room 1046, Roland actually left the hotel and no one is quite sure where he went, um, but he just left and exited the hotel and no one is sure when he actually came back. He came back at some point, but it didn't make a fuss. No one saw him come back. It wasn't that big of a deal. Guests come and go all the time at hotels, of course. So the same day as check-in, a maid came along to room 1046 just to do her basic cleaning and checking on the rooms. And from her statement, she said that Roland seemed very anxious, very nervous. She felt like something was wrong with him. And it's also noted that he was pretty much sitting in the dark by himself. He had closed the blinds and the only light coming from the room was a small lamp in the corner of this hotel room. The maid finished cleaning and checking the room, and as she was leaving, Roland actually asked her to leave the door unlocked because he was expecting a guest to his room. Now, later that day, the maid did return to give him some fresh towels, and she noted that there was a note on, like, the dresser. This note said, Dawn, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. She didn't ask him about this note, obviously, it's just something that she noticed in the room. Uh, Roland himself was laying on the bed with the room dark and didn't really have much of an interaction with her. She just saw this note for a person named Dawn, brought in the clean towels, and left. So the next day, this same maid returns to room 1046 just to do her normal check-ins and cleaning and so on, and the door was actually locked from the outside, so she assumed that Roland had left for the day or was out. Um, so she went in to do her cleaning service, and instead she found Roland still in his room, um, meaning to some degree that uh, someone had locked it from the outside, so um, I don't really know if he would have been locked in the room, but it was locked from the outside, so someone had left the room that wasn't Roland, because he was still there, obviously. Now this maid is kind of like a key witness to a lot of the mystery that happened surrounding this case. So as she was in the room once more, um, Roland was just sitting in the dark, not much interaction once more, but this time the phone rang and Roland actually picked it up and talked to someone on the other line. When he picked up the phone, he said, no Dawn, I don't want to eat. I am not hungry, I just had breakfast. So the maid finished working and then went about her business. Now once more, later that evening, she brought fresh towels to room 1046, but this interaction was actually different. When she came to the door, she couldn't come in and she could hear two male voices from inside room 1046. She knocked and tried to offer the fresh towels, but a rougher voice told her to basically go away, that they did not need any fresh towels. 
Uh, now this maid claims that the voice that spoke to her was not Roland. Uh, she had heard his voice on a couple different occasions and she claims that this voice that spoke to her through the door was not Roland's voice. So now for the timeline, we're going to step away from room 1046 for a little bit. These incidents are very important and could add to the mystery and clues to this case, but we're just going to step away from that particular room and roll in for a moment. So this same day, a motorist or a taxi driver, there's conflicting reports, uh, claimed that he was stopped near the President Hotel by a man that was like barely clothed. He was basically like wearing like undergarments, you could say, and this is in January. So it was a very odd sight to see someone so bare in the cold weather. Um, he stopped. This driver, Robert Lane, uh, claims that he spoke to this man and that he kind of looked like he had been beaten up and he was talking about how he was gonna get back at someone, he was gonna kill somebody the next day because of some sort of altercation. Now what's important is this driver would later identify this man that he had this interaction with as Roland T. Owen. So another incident that happened that night, a woman checked into room 1048 and she claims that a man and a woman kept her up the whole night from their arguing and fighting. Now it is needs to be noted that there was a party going on on the 10th floor. Um, so she could have been hearing this party or gathering that was happening a few rooms down, but she claims that it was right next door and that she could hear a man and a woman arguing and fighting and it kept her up most of the night. So that would be Roland's room. There's also another piece to that night from the elevator operator. Uh, he claimed that a very fancy looking woman came to the hotel and asked to be taken to floor 10 and that she was looking for someone in room 1026. Um, he thought that she looked very out of place, um, maybe for that side of town, whatever the case was, he took note of how fancy this woman looked and how very out of place. Now, she didn't stay long at the hotel. He took her up to the 10th floor and she was looking for room 1026, um, but she claimed she couldn't find who she was looking for and she left right after that. Now, some people theorize that she wasn't looking for room 1026, but 1046, and she got the number mixed up. It is interesting that this um, elevator operator remembered her from that night in question. Other theories suggest maybe she was part of that party or she could have been, you know, maybe a prostitute or something of that nature where she was not connected to this case at all. Or maybe she was that woman's voice that next door heard arguing between a man and a woman. So now we go to the next morning back to room 1046. So that morning, the hotel staff noticed that the phone was off the hook in room 1046. So they sent a bellboy up to ask the inhabitor to please put the phone back on the hook. Now the door was locked and there was a do not disturb sign on the door. So the bellboy knocked and he didn't hear for a bit and then he kept knocking and he heard someone say, come in and turn on the lights. Now because the door was locked, he couldn't come in and he basically just said through the door, yo, like, put your phone on the hook, please. And he went back downstairs. So about an hour goes by and the hotel staff notice that the phone is still off the hook. So they send up a different bellboy with a master key that would let them into room 1046. So this bellboy goes in and he finds Roland completely naked, laying in bed in a stain of some kind, a dark stain, probably blood. But this bellboy thought that he was just drunk or acting weird. He was on a mission, he got the phone back on the hook, and he pretty much just left Roland how he was, naked, in potentially a blood pile on the bed, went back downstairs and didn't tell anybody about what he had seen in room 1046. So then a few hours later, the phone is off the hook once again. So the original bellboy is sent up, and this time he found something like very crazy. Roland was there, of course, in a puddle of blood. There was blood everywhere in this hotel room. He had been stabbed multiple times in the chest. He had um, a head wound. It looked as if he had been strangled, maybe with the phone cord around his neck. He, there was blood, he was not doing well, but somehow he was still conscious. 
So at this point, it was pretty obvious that their hotel guest had been tortured in their hotel room. So they called the police. When the police got there, they were able to ask Roland, like, who did this to you? And he said that no one did it to him, that his injuries were from falling against the bathtub. Because stab marks and strangulation and all the stuff he had going on is definitely just from a fall in the bathroom. Not the case. <laughs> So he was of course taken to the hospital. Now, oddly enough, his clothes were missing from the room and a lot of his other personal items, but there were some other items put in the room that suggested that somebody else was in the room at some point and they had left things behind. It's also noted that there were no weapons found in the room, which is very important because it ruled out like self-inflicted wounds for this. Um, they estimated that he had been tortured about seven hours before they officially found him in that state. So a lot of people think that he was trying to call for help. That's why the phone kept going off the hook, but I guess the hotel workers just did not catch on that he was in need of assistance, especially that one that saw him like in a pool of blood. Yeah, they just weren't keen on helping their guests, I guess. So within this room, they found four fingerprints um, on the phone and I believe the lampshade. Now they claim that these fingerprints were female because of the shape of the print, but that doesn't sound accurate to me or legit. Obviously technology was not what it is today. This is 1935, but for the most part relating to this case, they claim that these prints were female because of the shape of them. That doesn't sound accurate, but that's what it claims. So Roland T. Owen was taken to the hospital and he actually fell into a coma. And then on January 5th, 1935, he passed away. As the investigation continues, the police are obviously trying to find out more information about Roland, um, connections or what happened to him, who did this. And as they dug and dug, they kind of discovered that Roland T. Owen didn't exist. There was no record of a Roland T. Owen ever existing. So who? Who really was Roland T. Owen? That wasn't his name. So who was he? For the case, he was declared a John Doe because they knew that that wasn't his real name. And he was going to be buried in like a potter's field. While the police investigated him, they did find that people recognized his face. He had been at local bars drinking with some women. Uh, they also found a connection to him at a different hotel. This hotel claimed that he had stayed there with another man, but he didn't use the name Roland T. Owen, he had used a different bogus name. So still, that was kind of a dead end. They didn't know what his real name was because he wasn't using real names everywhere he went. Now the media did get involved with this unsolved case and it kind of drew in a lot of family and loved ones that were curious if this John Doe was a missing loved one of theirs, a son, a brother, a friend. Uh, so to try and identify this John Doe, they did release pictures of him, hoping that some sort of family member or friend would step forward and be able to identify him. Because if they kind of find out his identity, maybe they could find out more of why this happened to him. Why was he tortured? What happened with this mystery of room 1046. They did try to take into account the maids, like witness statements, and so they looked into the name Dawn. She had seen it referenced on the note and on the phone call that she heard Roland talking to. So they tried to find the Dawn character. Could he have been responsible for this? Did he know what had happened? Who was John Doe? But everything relating to a person named Don went cold. They couldn't find anything for this case to help figure out what exactly had happened to this John Doe. So as they were planning for like a very standard burial for John Doe, something very interesting happened. An anonymous call came in asking if they could postpone this burial because they wanted to wire money so that John Doe could have a official burial and that they would pay for it. So clearly, someone knew who he was if they're offering to pay for his burial. But as I said, it was like an anonymous call and it's all very secrets. At his actual burial, 13 flowers were sent and they were signed Love Forever Louise. The only people to attend this burial were actually the detectives working the case. So they obviously saw the flowers, but someone had cared enough about this John Doe person to send flowers and to also pay for his burial. 
There are some things that say that the burial was paid for by a woman, probably the same woman that sent those flowers that day, while other people say that the anonymous call came from a man instead and that he's the one that paid for the burial and that he had mentioned like cheaters get what they have coming, you know, karma. So was he saying that this John Doe person had been up in a cheating scandal? Is that why he was beaten and tortured? So was the call from a man? Was it from Louise who sent the flowers? Who exactly knew what was going on with this John Doe character? And what's frustrating is we don't really have the answers to that. It is suggested that the specific burial location that was paid for was mentioned in the anonymous phone call because it would be close to someone's sister. We don't really know whose sister or if they were alive or if they were buried in the same place, what the case was, but the caller had picked that particular burial spot. You would think that some of these clues or things you could look up and figure out, like, I don't know, who Louise was or who was buried near this plot, you know, things like that. It's it's very interesting unsolved case and frustrating because it is unsolved. So as time went on, um, this case became cold. No one knew who John Doe was and so it just became a cold case. That is until we go to spring of 1936. A woman was reading a magazine that featured the image of this Roland John Doe person and she recognized it. She believed that it was her friend's missing son and it turned out that it was her son. So who is John Doe? What was his real name? John Doe was Artemis Ogletree. His mother confirmed that the man from room 1046 was in fact her son. She claimed that he was actually only 17 years old, so the guesstimate of 25 to 35 years old was completely off. He was like still a kid. I know that 1935 is different. Things were different back then, but still, he was like a teenager. So his mother explained that her son Artemis had been traveling the country and that he would write her letters and give her updates about where he was, but unfortunately the letters had stopped and she had no idea where to look for him or what had happened to him. Now, all of his letters were always handwritten. It was something like of his style of the letters he wrote to his mother, except for a couple of the last ones were actually written typed on a typewriter. Now, his mother noted that the last couple letters did not sound like her son. She didn't think it sounded like him, some of the phrases, some of the slang, just how things were worded. She didn't think it sounded like a letter from her son, and she also didn't even think that he could use a typewriter. And she missed his handwritten letters, so it was kind of a little bit of a red flag for her, but she didn't know where to look for her son. Now, you can probably guess, but the last couple letters that were typed on the typewriter and that didn't sound like Artemis, probably because it wasn't Artemis. The last three letters were received by his mother after Artemis Ogletree had already died from room 1046. So as they looked into more clues surrounding his mother, she said that she received a long distance phone call in 1935, August of 1935, um, from a man named Jordan. Now he claimed to be a friend of her son Artemis and that Artemis had been in a bar fight and he had lost a finger and so he could no longer write letters. So that was the explanation on why he had switched to a typewriter to send his mother letters. Uh, this Jordan person also claimed that Artemis had moved to Egypt, had found a beautiful wife and had gotten married and would be living in Egypt for the rest of his life without telling his mother. This Jordan person just thought that she should know that on a long distance phone call because that totally sounds legit. So clearly this call was never traced. Um, there wasn't even really a way to look into like who had called her. No one ever found out who Jordan was. She had never heard of Artemis having a friend named Jordan. There wasn't anything to go off of. It's clear that someone was trying to do some cover up. Someone was trying to direct his mother on a different path and give an excuse on where the hell her son had gone, even though it was total BS because her son was already dead. And it was kind of a nice story for this Jordan character to tell her why the handwritten letters had stopped. Like, is it safe to say that this Jordan person was probably typing the last couple letters? So why? Why was Artemis tortured? Or why did this happen to him? At least the theories, because this is an unsolved case and it's from 1935. So the chances of it being solved are very slim. 
Dawn is the popular theory. Um, whoever this Dawn person was, obviously the maid heard the name mentioned, saw the name written on the note. Um, people think that maybe Dawn was the rough voice that the maid heard through the door telling her that they didn't need towels and to just go away. So did he torture um, and, you know, cause him to die? Uh, we don't know. We don't know who Dawn was and all of the leads of the potential Dawn person went cold. There was nothing to find. Or was it a woman? We have a couple references to like a mystery woman for the 10th floor around this timeline. The one is from the elevator operator that the fancy woman that got off on the 10th floor. Was she related to Artemis somehow? Did she go on and speak with him? And then we have the other clue of the woman that heard arguing between a man and a woman next door. So was there someone in the room with Artemis, a woman? Could she have done something? How was she connected to this? Did something she say or do cause somebody else to come and torture him? We do not know. There was also the woman referenced for potentially paying for the burial and at l the very least sending the flowers for the burial day. But we don't know who Louise was or if that was her real name. And then there's the other theory that goes back to the anonymous call of a man paying for the burial and that he mentioned cheating and like was this a cheating scandal? Was this like a love triangle between like a man and the woman that visited him and then that's he got caught up in that and he got tortured because of it, you know, sleeping with the wrong person, we don't know. You know the whole like phone call with like the no dawn, I don't want to eat, I'm not hungry, I already had breakfast? This just sounds like a code to me. Like, I thought this when I was researching this case. That phrase just really sounds like a code word to me. Like, I don't know for who. Someone downstairs, someone calling, I have no idea, but it sounded very odd and specific for you to say. I don't know. It just was weird. So other people have suggested that maybe Artemis was gay. There's not really evidence for it, but there's not really evidence for a lot of these theories. Um, they suggest it could have been like um, a lover's quarrel type of thing. Uh, was Don his lover or his boyfriend? There was that other man that the other hotel suggested that Artemis stayed with. So was that like a couple? Were they just friends? Some people suggested that it could have been something like wrong with them as a couple or someone found out about them being gay. You know, it's 1935. Who knows? While researching this, I was also kind of curious if it was Dawn like D-O-N for a guy or like Dawn like D-A-W-N like for a woman's name. So I don't know how it was spelled or how it was on the note, but it could have been for a man or a woman in my opinion. The name Dawn could have been either. And then there are some theories that suggest that Artemis kind of got in with the wrong crowd and that this could have been related to the mafia. So how is this case perceived today? As I said, it's still unsolved. It's been reopened a couple times. Um, the newest one was the early 2000s when a doctor was kind of like researching the case. And the only thing that really came from that is during that time, like an anonymous tip, because everything's anonymous with this case, um, said that they had found like a trunk full of articles and newspaper clippings relating to this case, relating to Artemis and room 1046. And it was from an old man that had passed away. He had like a trunk full of all this. So was this old man connected to the case? Did, was he a friend? Did he know Artemis? Did he kill Artemis? Um, or was he just very interested in the case? But it was a dead end. Like, they didn't find anything with it. All of these leads, leads you would think, are all dead ends. And that's really why this case is still unsolved today. Okay, so what did you guys think of the mystery of room 1046? Which theory do you think best fits this situation? Um, you know, it's good that his mother was able to identify him and that she knew what happened to her son, but it's still very unfortunate that even the potential leads, what the maid saw, these other people paying for the burial, that nothing came of it and we'll never really know what happened to Artemis in room 1046 and who was there with him. As always, thank you so much for watching, lovelies, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye.